Hey yo, how is everyone doing? With everything going on right now from the midterm elections to the firestorm happening at tech companies to the imminent recession we're about to enter, I'm here to stress you out even more by reminding you that there are high production videos by religious people telling you that intelligent design is the way to go. This man has just suffered a serious stroke. His best chance for a full recovery is to receive proper medical treatment within 90 minutes. A 911 call alerts a dispatcher. The call is made to the hospital. When the patient arrives, he receives rapid, stroke-specific care. We just witnessed an efficient and very impressive response system that resulted in a good outcome for the patient. Today, we're gonna to look at a similar emergency response system. Wow, would you look at that production quality. All of that to educate you on a bodily process which is just too good and therefore God exists. They won't say that directly until the latter half of the video though. That being said, impressive production quality. However, immediately there's an issue with the message you're trying to send. At first, when I was watching this, I was like, okay, that makes very little sense. If you're trying to use the blood clotting mechanism as evidence of some sort to prove intelligent design, why did you give us an example of it trying to kill you? And then I realized, you did that skit because you wanted to emphasize the step-by-step -step actions taken in order to help this patient rather than emphasize the stroke specifically. Because that way, you can use that as an analogy for the actual step-by-step -step blood clotting cascade that your body takes to create a clot. I suppose for a different purpose, such as convincing people of irreducible complexity or something. But I think it's very ironic that you chose a stroke out of literally anything else because the blood clot is literally one of the main causes of a stroke. That really doesn't work well with your argument, but please, let's see what you have. A cut in a person's skin allows blood to flow freely. But with a cut this size, in a short time, the bleeding stops on its own. It stopped because of a sophisticated emergency response system operating under her skin. It's called the blood clotting cascade, and it's one of the true wonders of human physiology. Here's an overview of how it works. Okay, so here they do a bit of a grand overview regarding the mechanisms of coagulation. As much as I hate to admit it, it's actually a very good visualization of the process, so I do recommend people check it out. But of course, my issue with the video isn't necessarily regarding the biology of the coagulation cascade, but rather the takeaway message they are trying to send. I've seen countless videos by creationist YouTube channels that actually give decent biological explanations on something, followed by, oh my goodness, it must be God that done it. Anyway, if you don't want to watch the original video, I'll give a quick high school level overview on what this cascade entails. Your body detects a cut somewhere in your body when cells at the site are damaged and call for help. This attracts a variety of things in your blood such as platelets and various other proteins. Prothrombin turns into thrombin, which turns fibrinogen into fibrin, which links up to cover the exposed area. Now, in reality, it's a lot more complex than that. There's an extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, which both work independently and upstream of the final pathway. The purpose of the extrinsic pathway is to create thrombin and utilize it for various protein activations, which is then used to activate a bunch of other things such as coagulation factors 3 and 7, which are cofactors and promote further protein activations as well, such as, well, 8 and then ultimately 10. A lot of these form complexes with each other, but we won't go into too much detail here, especially since there are too many factor proteins to keep up with. Calcium and vitamin K are involved here, which is why a lack of vitamin K will lead to greater bleeding and a lack of clotting. Meanwhile, the intrinsic pathway also works with various factor proteins. Factor 12 is activated, which activates factor 11, which activates factor 9, which in combination with factor 8 activates factor 10. Factor 10 is the end goal for both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways because it is the starting point of the common pathway. A thrombinase complex forms when an activated factor 10 combines with calcium, which changes prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin chops up fibrinogen to fibrin and factor 8 to activate factor 8. Fibrin, factor 8, and calcium then ultimately form a fibrin link, which contributes to the clot. Now, that's a simplified but also kind of crazy overview of the clotting cascade. I hope I didn't lose you there. In general, just know that a lot of proteins are involved in it and the pathway is dependent on a lot of different elements such as the factor proteins, thrombin, fibrin, platelets, calcium, vitamin K, etc, etc. All of this happens incredibly quickly, and from hearing this, it can be easy to think it's some grand creation by an intelligent designer, but is it really? Let's continue the video. That is, unless coagulation continues, and the expanding clot blocks her blood vessel. Not to worry, other heroes join the fray. Two of the strongest are antithrombin and thrombomodulin. They switch off thrombin, and the fibrinogen is not activated to become fibrin. 
Right, so we have a couple of inhibitors from antithrombin, as mentioned in the video, to protein C, which helps degrade some of the coagulation factor proteins, etc. And like everything else in the body, moderation is important. Nothing is truly just good or bad for you, it's the dosage that matters. And the same applies to coagulation. There are a number of disorders associated with the malfunctioning of the clotting cascade that can cause some serious harm. Coagulopathy is when your clotting abilities are impaired, which results in too much bleeding. But the one I want everyone's attention on is the opposite, in which there's too much clotting which can cause issues. Take for example thrombophilia. This is a disease in which you have an increased chance of thrombosis, which is really just a fancy way of saying blood clots. There are a variety of causes, one of which is just an overactivation of coagulation factors. This results in too much clotting, which can restrict blood flow. The reason I wanted to emphasize this point in particular is because this could be the exact reason someone gets a stroke. Of course, where the clot forms is a roll of the die. Your condition differs depending on where it lands. If it's at the lungs, it's a pulmonary embolism. If it's near the brain or at a major artery that feeds the brain, it's an ischemic stroke. So your example of that person getting a stroke in the beginning of the video is evidence against you. The system is not perfect and there is a lot of room for error, something that wouldn't be present if an intelligent designer truly designed everything intelligently. It's really a beautiful, finely tuned system. It works fine for the vast majority of people out there, but for many this system really fails them. I guess everyone is finely tuned, but some people are more finely tuned than others. How might the amazing cascade have evolved? Are there beneficial mutations that drive evolution? For life to evolve, we would need beneficial mutations. Sticking with today's subject, can we find any beneficial mutations occurring in blood? Well, that's easy. I can tell you in no uncertain terms that the answer is yes. And no. Yes, obviously beneficial mutations exist. They're about to give a very, very specific example of sickle cell and malaria, which is like one specific, specific example of a mutation being both beneficial and detrimental. I'm not exactly sure what purpose this serves, really. A fraction of people in these regions have a condition called sickle cell trait which is caused by a mutation that leads their bodies to produce slightly altered hemoglobin. It also makes them resistant to the malaria parasites, which gives them a degree of natural immunity to malaria. The sickle cell mutation is often pointed to as a clear example of evolution. Those points are true, but there's more to the story. In its strongest form, sickle cell also results in anemia, severe swelling, and infections. While it does help with malaria, the bottom line is that sickle cell itself can be very harmful. Sickle cell is just one example of mutations that are ultimately harmful. In fact, the overwhelming majority of non-neutral genetic mutations are damaging, not helpful. Okay, so he's basically saying beneficial mutations exist, but look at this example of sickle cell where it seems like it's beneficial but ultimately it's detrimental. Then transitions that to the vast majority of non-silent mutations are harmful. Okay, so this is very misleading for obvious reasons. First of all, sickle cell disease isn't really something we give as an example of evolution. There are many, many others that are more common, such as the peppered moths example. Sickle cell is more so an example we give of a mutation that is detrimental, but hasn't been weeded out of the population. And the reason for that is because there is a beneficial side to it as well. People who are heterozygous for sickle cell can still contract malaria, but symptoms are less severe. For homozygous individuals, they enjoy a greater resistance to malaria because the red blood cells will rupture quickly before the parasite is able to reproduce. In theory, any detrimental gene should be weeded out naturally by the mechanisms of evolution, but in reality that's not always the case, and sickle cell is an example of that. That being said, don't think all beneficial mutations are similar to sickle cell, which is another thing that the original video got wrong but is trying to imply to the audience. You can have purely beneficial mutations with little to no detriments, such as the human color vision or the ability for bacteria to resist drugs, some of which do indeed come with a resource cost, but that's minuscule compared to the benefits. So to answer our question, no, there is no evidence that beneficial mutation results in constructive changes for advancing evolution. Why give hypotheticals when we can talk about the blood clotting cascade specifically? Because this example would really show us how a beneficial mutation can arise. A system is individual components that are interconnected to perform a task. As we see here, a well-constructed sequence reaches the target. But a critical path that has a flaw will fail. 
The many proteins are interconnected and interdependent. Each one makes an essential contribution to the system's success. Okay, so this is basically just the irreducible complexity argument, which we've all heard a million times already. Basically, he's saying that each of the pieces is important in the overall cascade system. It couldn't have evolved through evolution, which he understands as sort of a trial and error in putting a piece in individually, one after another, until it works. Unfortunately, that's not the proper understanding on how evolution produced the coagulation cascade. Rather, you can think of it as a simple system at first that didn't have all the same components. Think of it like this. First, when a cut occurs on the skin that causes bleeding, you have a lot of systems that are activated already. Simply being exposed to oxygen will cause the activation, movement, or release of many proteins and signals to things that aren't even clotting related. Then, one of those proteins could have mutated to create some sort of clotting mechanism at the damaged site. After that, evolution takes over and builds the system from there. Each protein added, adding an additional functionality to the system. It's very simple if you think about it the right way, but creationists often don't have the creativity to think of such things. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean the system evolved specifically like how I described it just now, but that's just one out of the many possibilities which is not impossible to achieve. And that's all that matters, because your claim relies on the idea that no other alternative explanation is possible using evolution, so just by providing one here already disproves your claim. Anyway, that shall be the end of the video today. He goes on more about addressing some counter arguments but I don't find it particularly interesting since you're always going to run into issues of straw man. Thank you to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Miss Fixit, and Edward Martin for supporting this channel on Patreon. I'll see you later.